Ah, the power of a mother's love. Well, in John chapter 1, we see Jesus coming to the River Jordan, John bearing witness, telling that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Holy Spirit came upon him and remained upon Jesus. That was the first and the next day, Jesus continued walking around, and some of John's disciples started following Jesus. And the third day after that, some other things happened with Nathaniel and Philip. Now, Nathaniel was under a, what kind of a tree? A fig tree. Everybody that went to the camp out knows that. Nathaniel was under a fig tree, and Jesus said, Before, I even, before you even knew me, Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. So I've decided somehow I've got to start what I want to call a fig tree fellowship. Because I believe that Jesus sees everybody where they're at right now. And he wants us to go find them and bring them to him. Just like Philip did. Philip brought Nathaniel. Jesus is looking at everybody in your neighborhood. He knows where they're at. And a lot of them, in fact, most of the people in this world are in a bad place. Because most of the people of this world, according to Jesus, the path is wide and the way that leads into destruction is many upon it. But the way is narrow and fewer upon that one that goes into heaven. So he knows where the people are in your life, in your neighborhood, where you work. And he wants you to bring them to him. Just like Philip brought Nathaniel. But here in chapter 2, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. You know how incredible that is? That God has a human mother. The mother of Jesus. Jesus is God. He's completely God. He's also completely human. But I think that's incredible that the creator of the universe would come down and live inside of a sinner. Now, as great as Mary was as a believer and as a follower of God, that the holy, infinite, eternal, pure creator of the universe would come down and live inside of a sin, sinful capsule, a sinful existence, being. That's a God who loves us so much that he comes when we need him. And they were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, make no mistake about it, there was wine at the wedding. Now, most people think this gives them an excuse to go and to the liquor store and buy some some. Uh, Mogan David wine or some other kind of wine or whatever kind of wine. But the fact is, back in that day, the fermentation processes took, you had to drink a couple of gallons of wine in order to get a little tipsy. Do you remember in the book of Acts, we were there, we're going back there next Sabbath, but in the book of Acts, remember they came out of the upper room and they were so happy and excited and they were wanting to tell everybody about the great things that they'd learned from Jesus and about Jesus. And Peter stood up and he said, Men and brethren, these men are not drunk, as you are thinking, seeing that it is only the ninth hour of the day. They are not drunk on wine. You would literally have to get up at early in the morning and drink all day long in order to get drunk on the wine of those days. So if you want to drink that much wine to get a little tipsy, we need to have a discussion about overindulging in grape juice. Because if you want to really get drunk, forget the grape juice, go get the hard stuff. And then maybe we can have another conversation. I really don't want you to go get the hard stuff, but do you get the point? Don't be so silly as to think that Jesus was getting drunk at some wedding. You know what? I've never seen alcohol cause a person to become a better Christian. Never. I've never seen alcohol lead a person closer to Jesus. Never. Ever. 
Never, ever, never, never, ever. So for a Christian to stand up and say, Jesus is cool with alcohol, you are, well, I won't even finish that. You finish it. They ran out of wine. The mother of Jesus said to him, to Jesus, they have no wine. You don't know how tempted I was to preach that other sermon, but now we're going to go on with this one. Jesus said to her, woman. Now Jesus is talking to his mom. And you know, in, in, in the Middle East, the, the customs were kind of, kind of rough. You know, if you grew up in a German home or a German community, you know what rough is. But I think the Jewish community kind of culture and their little, little, little incrisistic little incanisms or whatever. I just made a word up. But anyway, they are really, the Jewish people are really rough. They're kind of rough. You know, they're kind of tough with the way they talk to the people and the way they work with each other. Germans are pretty rough like that too. And so Jesus is kind of in that Jewish culture and he goes, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Now let me tell you something. If I'd have talked to my mom like that, I might have woke up a week later. <laughs> well, not really, but you, got, you get the point. Uh, but that's just the way it was acceptable in the, in the Jewish culture. Don't think that Jesus was rude or disrespectful to his mother. He wasn't. That, that's just, it was acceptable, and that was a, a colloquialism of the, of the uh, grammar of that day. And he said, my hour has not yet come. In other words, it's not time for me to start working miracles. Jesus said that. He said, why is this a concern to me? I, my time has not come yet to start doing these kind of things that you're thinking about here. His mother said to the servants, now this is just like a mom. She didn't even hear it. She, did, she didn't pay one attention to what he just said. And praise God for that. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there's a whole sermon right there. Whatever you hear God telling you from the Bible, give your life to it. Do it with all your heart. Give it everything you've got. Anything you find God saying to you in the Bible, go for it. With all your might. With all your power. And the greatest way to use all your might and all your power is to ask for help from the God of heaven who tells you what you're supposed to do. Just say, okay, God, I see what you're telling me here in, in Ezekiel or maybe it's in Proverbs. I don't know. Whatever you, wherever you find God talking to you, whenever God's, when you know the Spirit is cutting deep into your innermost soul, just say, okay, God, I see that. I know you're getting after me here and I know you're trying to direct me here. But Lord, unless you do it, it ain't going to happen. He loves to hear that. Because that's the truth. Unless the creator of the universe comes into my soul and empowers me and instructs me and enables me, I can't do anything. I can't even breathe without him giving me the power to do so. My heart will not beat one more beat without him giving my heart the power to do so. That's how dependent I am and we are on Jesus. And man, I am so excited about that. Because if I was dependent on you for my heart to keep beating, I'm in big trouble. If I was dependent on my mother for my heart to keep beating, I'm still in big trouble. Amen. Praise God we have a real Savior, Creator. Whatever He says to you, here's the counsel of the ages. One of the greatest things any human has ever said, Mary said it. Whatever He says to you, do it. But always remember to go to Him to get the power before you go try to do it. Amen? Amen. Now there were three, there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews. They had to do all these washings all the time. I mean, they had to wash. Can you imagine how chapped their hands got? These guys were washing 20 times a day, maybe 30 times a day. I don't know. They must have had some real good olive oil that they smacked on after they got all chapped on their hands. But anyway, they had this, this, all these ceremonies. They were just overblown on this thing. I mean, you talk about out of control. They were just psychos about making sure there wasn't a speck of dust on a finger or something. 
Anyway, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Now that's pretty big. 20 or 30 gallons is a pretty big pot. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. Huh. I wonder who nudged Jesus. You know what is really cool? Mary, well, I, I say raised, but you raise corn, you rear children. So Mary reared, that's the old-fashioned word, you know, for raising. Mary raised Jesus. She instructed him. She taught him things. The Holy Spirit spoke to her and instructed her and told her what to tell Jesus as he was growing up. And there were things that she cherished in her heart and waited for the right time to tell Jesus. She, there were some things she couldn't tell Jesus when he was four and five years old. She had to wait to tell him things when he was ten years old. And here she is. She's finishing her motherhood ministry to Jesus. And the, I believe this. Now I'm going to have to ask Mary when I get there. And of course, the Holy Spirit and Jesus. We're going to have some incredible conversations in heaven. Can you imagine? And I'm going to ask Mary. I say, Mary, now tell me the truth here. And of course she will. I'm going to say, that day at the wedding, did the Holy Spirit tell you to kind of poke Jesus a little bit? Trying to kind of, kind of push him out of the nest a little bit? Was, was the Holy Spirit using you to kind of prompt him to go ahead and launch that day? Because Jesus just said, my hour's not come. And then the next few minutes, here he is doing it. And God used Mary to get him going. Just like she used him when he was, just like the Holy Spirit used Mary when he was four years old, when he was six years old, when he was eight and ten years old. God used Mary and Joseph. You know good and well he did. Because Jesus had to grow up as a human being just like you had to grow up as a human being. He didn't know everything when he was four. He didn't know everything when he was 10. I don't believe he knew everything when he was 12. In fact, the Heavenly Father gave Jesus a revelation in about 95 AD that he had never given to anybody. Book of Revelation says he gave it to Jesus. Now, if Jesus already had it, why would the Father be giving it to him? Jesus gave it to the angel. The angel gave it to John. Guess who John gave it to? Me. Now that's my testimony. The book of Revelation is a beautiful testimony of how God works in this universe and how it all comes through Jesus. Wow. He's a pretty big guy. He's a big, Jesus is a big deal. He's a big person in this universe. You can't get anywhere without him. It all comes through Jesus. And Jesus, now he's activated. Man, he's off and running. He wasn't five minutes ago. My hour's not come. Here he is. Whoa. Mary has finished her work. Her last work of mothering him is to prompt him into his public ministry. And I tell you, the greatest thing any mother can do is to train up their boys and girls in the ways of heaven and then prod them, poke them, nudge them, and always encourage them. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. You can do it. It's time. Amen. So they filled these water pots to the brim. I found this picture. I think that's a pretty cool picture. I think the pots were a lot bigger than that because it held 20 and 30 gallons. Those are about three-gallon pots, but, but that's what some artists did. And Jesus said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. By the way... Nick and Angela, they are brand new newlyweds, married last Sunday. Stand up. We want to congratulate them. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Nick and Angela. Amen. We, amen. I just happen to have a pot of wine right over here. 
the new wine. It's invisible. Jesus said, be drunk on the new wine of the Spirit. But congratulations on your first week of wedded bliss. It only gets better from here on out. Amen. Because all, because Romans 8, 28 is true. All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. If you're married and you're not living under that promise, you in big trouble, Bubba. You need to, you need to learn how to use the word or let the, the word use you and live under those promises. And he will take all those uh, what, you know, my wife and I, have, and my son can attest to this. My wife and I have never argued, never had one fight in our whole lives. We have what is called heated fellowship. <laughs> but we put it under the word, man. We put it under the word. Put it under the word. Put it under Romans 8, 28. Your marriage will not be what it could be if you lived under Jesus. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. So this, this master of ceremony is a little bit bent out of shape. Why did you keep the best taste in wine till last? This is the freshest, the, the sweetest, the, the, the cleanest. Well, you know, you messed up my, my catering service. Man, nobody will want to hire me after they see this blunder. That it, it looks like I'm the one that messed up. See, he was feeling bad. You know, you're making me look bad here, buddy. Isn't it funny how when, you, when you're not really following Jesus, all you're thinking about yourself and how bad you might look? Whew. Heaven help us. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. He manifested his glory by obeying his mama. He wasn't, he didn't want anything to do with what she was up to. He said, what has this got to do with me? My time has not yet come. But Mary knew something. And I got to ask this, I got to have this conversation with Mary and Jesus. I want to get to the bottom of this thing when we get there. It may be, it may be 50 billion years later. I don't know when it's going to be, but I'm going to remember this question. I am. I hope. And I want to ask you. So the beginning of signs manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Meeting the needs of a wedding party, a wedding celebration. God loves a good party. And he loves to meet the needs of those who are, who are celebrating in a pure heart and in a, in a blessed heavenly way. Always invite Jesus to your parties. Amen. And you do that by saying, let's all bow and pray. And if you can't bow and pray when your best friends are there partying, then you need to find some new friends by praying them into Jesus. That's how you find new friends. You take your old friends and you pray them into Jesus. And if they won't come, you get a rope and tie them up and drag them. <laughs> Not really, but you, you'd like to, but that doesn't work. They might throw you in jail if you do that. But you sure like to. Wouldn't you like to tie a few people up and just take them to heaven? That won't work. If it worked, God had already done it with all of us. But God manifested his glory in this beautiful, simple, humble way. He turned that water into fresh, sweet, new wine. Unfermented, it was brand new. Clean and sweet. Refreshing. Reminds me of a song. Jesus is the sweetest name of all, and he's just the same as his holy name. And that's the reason why I love him so. 
Yes, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Amen. Now, as we conclude, Jesus is talking about the fruit of the vine in John 15. I am the vine. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, a dresser is someone who takes care of the vineyard. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Here's some a cluster of grapes. Here's a vineyard. God says, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you don't bear, if you don't allow the Holy Spirit to flow through your life, that's the fruit he's talking about of Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. If you don't allow the fruit of the life of Christ to flow through your life, then he eventually will break you off and he says he'll throw you into the fire. That's heavy duty. That's really a sad part of the gospel. But the good part of the gospel is if you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life, that means you're bearing fruit whether you can see it or not. If you've invited the Holy Spirit to come and live in you, you are bearing fruit whether you can see it or not, whether anybody else can see it or not. They may tell you, well, I thought you were a Christian. You sure don't act like a Christian. I don't see any evidence you're a Christian. All you just tell, just tell them, say, well, you don't need to see it. My father sees it, and all he sees is perfect. Because I'm under Jesus, and all he sees is Jesus. You need to be able to tell them. You need to be able to say that. And you for sure need to be able to say that to the, to the devil, to the enemy of God. Because those invisible thoughts that poke into your head like fiery darts, and he tells you, well, you've been trying this for two or three years. Man, you know better than you were two or three years ago. You can't do it. You might as well go back to drinking or doping or prostituting or whatever you were doing. You might as well go back to that. You're not going to get to heaven. You know what you, tell, you need to tell him? You need to, Satan, you get behind me. On the authority of Jesus Christ, I belong to Jesus. He purchased me with his blood. He lives in me by the Holy Spirit. And I am his property. You leave me alone. Amen. And I know I'm not the only one that needs to do that. In John 15, he says, you are already clean. Not because of what you've done. Because of the word I put in you. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Not because of your works. Not because of any performance of anything. You're clean because of my word is in you. Abide in me. Live in me. And let me live in, and me living in you. Let's live together. Let's do this thing together. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now Jesus is really talking about making wine here. This is some eternal wine here. That, that wine that flows through the vine into the branches and produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now we're making real wine. Sweeter wine than anybody could ever imagine. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. When Jesus repeats something, you got to know this is important. And he just repeated it. He just repeated it. What he said there, he just repeated it. When Jesus is not doing something because he's forgetful. He repeats things, that means this is big stuff. In fact, in John 17, Jesus prayed, Father, that they... That they, those who believe because of the words of the disciples, those who believe based on the words that the disciples will preach, those who believe that they may be one with you and I, even as you and I are one. That's a big prayer. And it even gets bigger. I mean, it's cool. It, it's, it's almost easy to be one with God. I mean, you can love God. He's lovable, right? It's kind of easy to just finally give it all, take hold of Jesus and say, let's go, I'm, I'm yours. But then he goes on, he says, that, that, that they may be one with each other. The same way you and I are one. Now we got some serious surrendering to do. For me to, to become harmonious with you, as messed up as you are? <laughs> Woo! That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? <laughs> But we're all so needy. We're all so, quote, messed up. 
We need to just love each other just the way we are and do everything we can to help each other. Amen? Amen. And be one with each other in Christ as much as we can. Can't do anything without Jesus. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. He's repeating. He already talked about this about four verses ago. And here he is repeating again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. It just, he repeats and expands. Jesus is always repeating and expands. All the way from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Jesus is always repeating and expanding. He's always repeating something and then adding a little more icing to the cake. Or a few candles. Or maybe some flowers. I don't know what he, he's just building. He's building a huge kingdom. And all the way from Genesis to Revelation, he repeats and expands. And that's what he's doing here. Now he says, not only if you abide in me and me in you, you will bear fruit. Now he says, if you ask anything you desire, it shall be done for you. All right? I want a Lamborghini. <laughs> or a Maserati Buick. That's not what God's talking about. He's saying, once you're attached to Jesus, once you're attached to me, Jesus, and my life is flowing through you like new wine, and the fruit of the Spirit starts popping into your life, you're only going to ask for the things that Jesus asked for when he was here. That's why God knows, once you're abiding in this experience, he can give you anything you desire because he knows you're going to have new desires. And you're not going to ask for Lamborghinis or Rolls Royces. And I just lost the whole system here. Oh, there it is. Cool. Check that out. Wow. That's the vineyard God is looking for in your life. He wants you to be so fruitful. He wants your life to be full like that. And he's the one. He can deliver. He can do it. Concord grapes. These must be Thompson. Here's our last verse. How powerful is a mother's love? As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I can't imagine what it was like the first time the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You're going to be pregnant. And you're going to have a baby, Messiah baby. He's going to save the world from their sins. I can't imagine how terrified she was as a young girl. I can't imagine how terrible it was when people made fun of her and gossiped and spread ugly rumors about her being pregnant out of wedlock and things like that. Even Joseph, he wasn't even going to, after he found it, he, he, he was thinking, well, she must have been laying with some other man. I can't marry you. I'm putting you out of my life. And then the Holy Spirit had to go to him and shake his world up with the impossible. Mind-blowing. The nerve that Mary had to have to run the race that God put her in, to, to do the mission. You talk about impossible, mission impossible. I mean, that's the real Mission Impossible. They should, take to, they should tell Tom Cruise he needs to make a new movie. The real Mission Impossible includes Mary and Joseph. So no matter what God asks you to do, he will give you the power of his love, because that's the real power in the mother, in Mary. He will give you the power of his love to accomplish any mission he calls you to do. Absolutely. Jesus knows firsthand how hard it is to do something you don't want to do. The faith of Jesus at least includes this. Father, I know what you want me to do in the garden. In the garden of Gethsemane. Before the soldiers came to arrest him. Father, I know what you want me to do. I don't want to do this, but I'll do it anyway. 
that's, that's what we call love faith. Not just faith, love faith. He loved his father enough to trust his father to lead him to and through and to the other side of that mission. Praise God. Amen. That's the Jesus. That is the Jesus that the Holy Spirit is asking you to follow. And I beg you to do so. Right now, Shawnee is going to sing another song for us. And uh, I love this song. I'm just thankful that she's here to sing it. Amen. Check it, check it. Yeah, it's on. strength is perfect, so perfect. Through Christ, who gives me strength, but sometimes I wonder what He can do through me. No great success to show, no glory of my own. Yet, in my weakness, he is there to let me know his strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can't carry on raised in his power the weak become strong his strength is perfect his strength is perfect can only know the power that he holds till we truly see how deep our weakness goes his strength in us begins when ours comes to an end he hears our humble cry and proves again his strength is perfect when our strength is gone he carries us when we can't carry strong his strength is perfect his strength is perfect when our strength is gone he'll carry us when we can't carry
you, Shauna. And thank you, Lord Jesus. As you open your heart to be a, a branch in that vine, Jesus is still turning water into wine. The water of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain of the Holy Spirit, it comes from Jesus, through Jesus. It comes to us, the branches, and we can bear fruit. As you go today, May you go in the power of a mother's love because that power is the power of Jesus. God bless you as you go. Amen.